Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Erin News and today is August 5th, 2024. Monday, August 5th, 2024. And let's go to Stranger Than Fiction Stories and this is about a very ancient structure in the UK. The question is, who haunts the ancient Ram Inn? The ancient Ram Inn is touted as one of Britain's most haunted establishments sitting on land that dates back to the Bronze Age. The ancient Ram Inn is one of England's oldest inns and can be found in the village of Woton under Edge in Gloucestershire. It is famed to have such terrifying ghosts that those trying to spend a whole night have fled through a closed, door, a closed window. Evidence paints a dark and disturbing past of witchcraft, murder, torture, kidnap, and satanic worship providing a source for the numerous spirits that are said to inhabit it. This area of Gloucestershire has been inhabited at least since the Bronze Age. A structure of some type was built in 1145. The deeds are mostly in Norman French, which substantiates the age of the settlement. William Fitzrobert, heir to Lord Berkeley, served as the first rector of Woton. Much of Woton under edge was destroyed by fire in the reign of King John, which from 1199 to 1216. However, the building survived. Located on Potter's Pond, streams are diverted to lay the foundation for St. Mary the Virgin Church. The once large pond, now dry, was used for Woton Mill. What's left present day is an underground stream that runs under the inn and surfaces beyond it. Some theorize the site was picked specifically like other Christian cathedrals built during the Middle Ages on ley lines. One of the ley lines at the Ramen runs between Ley Farm and Hetty Pegler's Trump also known as Uli Long Barrow. The burial barrow was named for Hester Pegler, who owned the land in the 17th century and dates back to Neolithic times. John Humphreys, who once owned the inn, claimed the line ran through the center of Stonehenge and the other through Glastonbury Tor. The redirection of water is known to open portals. The area in ancient times was known as Sinwell, which is believed to be Celtic for seven wells. During the 13th century, besides the erection of the church, there was a school, almshouse, and the Woton House of Friars. In 1469, William Lord Buckley and Viscount Lyle engaged in a private battle where Viscount Lyle was killed and the lands in the Woton area, which had been disputed for over 200 years, reverted to the Berkeley family. Connected with the church, the original inn was larger than its present form and had been a home to the local priest. It also served as a keeping house for stonemasons and workers used in the construction of St. Mary the Virgin Church. The church was consecrated in 1283 by Godfrey Gifford, Bishop of Worcester, or Worcester. However, it took 171 years to complete the structure since Gerinus, or Gerinius, a vicar recorded it in 1154, and it was deemed completed in 1325. Around this time, it came into the possession of Maurice de Bath and stayed in the de Bath family for almost the next two centuries. Through the next 400 years, it changed hands many times and went by different names. At one point, it was known by the locals as the Old Sun, and in 1694 as the Tan House. It was then that Edward Wallington and Edward Burton passed ownership to Jonathan Nelms, the mayor. In 1724, it was referred to as Horse Pool House. In 1820, it became the property of Keltenham Original Brewery Company, who licensed, who licensed it out as an alehouse. This is also when it became known as the Ram Inn. As a pub, it also bottled and sold its own mineral water sourced from a spring behind the inn. In 1882, it was licensed to Thomas Mizzen, and then in 1906, V.G. Vogt transferred it to Rufus Morley, and by 1950, the licensee was Arthur F. Smith. Throughout the years, the building deteriorated. The interior was infested with death watch beetles and the walls were crumbling. It had no running water, which it still doesn't, and was slated for demolition. It was closed for three years when it was saved by John Humphreys, who purchased it for £2,600 in 1969. He had plans to complete renovations himself and open it as a guest house since he was prohibited from using it as a pub and compete with other pubs in the area. Old Cotswold stone walls were uncovered, and in one room an artificial wall was cleared away to reveal an ancient fireplace. Original wattle and daub partition walls 
which are sticks plastered with cow dung and straw, were revealed, and upstairs the attic still had tree limbs that supported the roof. The Roman tiles on the roof were to be replaced with Cotswold stone tiles. Tiles. He also had plans to reopen two windows which were bricked up in the dim past. Humphreys also had plans to make it a museum in memory of Stephen Hopkins, America's most famous pilgrim father. He left Woten, was shipwrecked in Bermuda in 1609, and arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1610. He returned to England in 1614 and sailed on the Mayflower in 1620 with his second wife and their children. Humphreys was using timbers and Cotswold stone slates from an old barn that belonged to Hopkins' descendant, a local farmer named Graham Hopkins. During the renovation was found, the inn had the oldest wooden window frame in Britain, as well as the earliest surviving board for the game Nine Men's Morris, which appears carved into a stone ingle nook dated to 1540. In 1971, Humphreys bought the former mortuary next door. John Humphreys believed the site went back to pre-Christian Britain when it was a pagan burial ground. He claimed a wooden post in the building dated back to 3000 BC, and that besides burying the populace in these grounds, ritual human sacrifices were carried out there. Alternately, there is no proof the building predates 1495, and it's theorized it was originally a domestic house involved with a thriving wool trade, and about a hundred years later, it was a church house, which lastly was used as a public house. That another structure existed prior to the 15th century was demolished and the present structure was erected on its foundation is very possible. Around 1976, the Humphreys separated when John admitted his homosexuality, which up to 1967 was illegal in the UK. By the early 1980s, ghost investigators were being invited to the Old Ram Inn to experience the hauntings, the most infamous being the Bishop's Room, once the Berkeley Room, situated on the first floor. The ghost of a cavalier King Charles Spaniel is seen in the corner. There are also reports of monks, nuns, men and women, and even a Roman centurion on horseback who came in through the wall of the room, witnessed by a plumber working that day. It's believed the devil worship took place in this room. The bishop's room supposedly earned its name when Reverend Jan, John Yates, a one-time bishop of Gloucester, attempted to exorcise the pub without success, and he said it was, quote, the most evil place I have ever had the misfortune to visit, end quote. It's an unverified story, and it's not sure when this occurred, since in 1984, John Humphrey said, I want to find out what's behind it all, as in the hauntings. I don't want it destroyed by exorcism. A local dowser had told Humphreys that the inn was built on an old graveyard and that beneath the floors were scores of bodies, many of them children, who were the victims of human sacrifice. The dowser also located an old well beneath the floorboards. In a spot where Humphreys had found an ancient bayonet, the dowser said the body of a woman killed by soldiers was buried there. Later, Humphreys claimed the dowser was accurate when he dug up part of the floor at the foot of the staircase and found children's bones. He also found daggers in the pit, which a later archaeological report described they were of great age. In 2014, they were stolen from a glass cabinet and were not recovered. Humphreys also found a mummified cat immured in the bishop's room, room's ingle nook. Historically, placing a cat in the structure was used as a talisman against witches. The Stroud Museum confirmed the cat was dead before being placed in the building and could be four to five hundred years old. He also found the remains of a woman and a baby buried under the kitchen floor. The kitchen had once been a tack room for the former stables, occupying the far end of the ground floor. Allegedly behind the bar, another woman is buried, a victim of a highwayman. Ironically, there is a story that two highwaymen hid in a space between the roofs. According to Humphreys, when he was sent a copy of a will belonging to Thomas Waite of Sinwell, a tanner who owned the inn in 1694, paranormal activity increased. The photograph of Rufus Morley, once a keeper, there also disturbed the ghosts. John Humphreys believed there were at least five ghosts at the inn. Visitors had seen a cavalier, a lady called Elizabeth, Tom the Tramp, a monk, and a shepherd. Visitors had said the complaint of feeding a presence, hearing strange bangs, cold spots, and an incident when a bed was raised off the floor and the person thrown to the floor. Humphreys said he kept seeing the ghost of a very old man upstairs, which he thought was Thomas Waite. 
three young people exited the inn via window in the middle of the night because they were so scared. Humphreys described a presence that was so strong and awful that it will follow you out of the room into the car park and along the road. Two men who stayed in the bishop's room had such a frightening experience they had to be exorcised by a vicar at the church. He banned them from returning. Humphreys described the presence in the bishop's room as one of doom, gloom, death, and despondency, and the temperature in the room drops to zero. He believed that the increase in paranormal activity was due to his alterations of the building. In 1999, Julie Hunt took a photo at the Ram Inn, which captured what she believed was a photograph of a ghost on the stairs. Humphreys also reported the existence of an incubus and a succubus at the inn. He claimed the incubus would torment him at night. The barn, which dates back to the 18th century, has not been spared, which some historians believe was once the site of a Saxon church. There is a report of an aggressive dark shadow that measures seven feet that guards the doorway. There are also burials around the inn that date back to when the Black Death swept through Europe in 1348. Humphreys was the only one in the family who never moved out of the inn. When the inn was experiencing a rash of burglaries, a CCTV system was installed. Noises of breaking furniture and other odd noises would be captured even though the only one inside the structure was John Humphreys. Strangely though, despite its age dating back hundreds of years, the inn never received publicity as a haunted site until the arrival of John Humphreys in 1969. Early 20th century touring guides or older works of folklore for the area do not make reference to it in this context at all. It's unknown if the ghostly occurrences described by late 20th century ghost hunters were a result of being primed by Humphrey stories. Prior to his death in 2017, at age 89, the inn was cluttered by a man who obviously was a hoarder with a penchant for the macabre. Like a man obsessed, he was buried in the local cemetery from a spot that overlooks the inn and faces the property. His daughter Caroline now runs the inn as a place where paranormal investigators can visit for a chance at a first-hand ghostly encounter. It is listed as a grade 2 building. Now, again, makes you wonder, was all this haunting something that, like they say, primed, was primed by John Humphreys? But then again, you think, even if it didn't, let's, let's go with the, that there was no structure that predated the 15th century or the 14th century. That's still, that's a long time for a lot of stuff happened under its roofs. A lot, a lot. So, yeah, there's a good chance that there was something there. Now, as to the, I don't know, what he's found dug up. I'm sure I wouldn't be surprised if nothing was found. But again, I guess that's what makes it such an interesting place. All right. Next story is also out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories, and this one is titled Bachamama's Tribute. In 2022, a 30-year-old man claimed he was buried alive as part of a sacrifice to Pachamama when the earth is the hungriest. The Pachamama festival is celebrated by the indigenous people where offerings are made to the goddess in the form of sacrifices ranging from live animals, sheep fetus, Desiccated, ya, llama, eh, desiccated llamas, eggs, minerals to coca leaves, and sweets. They believe she opens her mouth for these offerings. This ceremony is especially important to those who are involved in agriculture. Victor Hugo Michael Alvarez, age 30, described where he had been attending a Mother Earth Festival being celebrated on August 1, 2022 in Bolivia, where people gathered at dawn for a ritual to Pachamama, also known as Madre Tierra. He lived in Chile and came to Villa Victoria to attend the festivities and perform with a group that presents Toba's dance. This is a folkloric dance that dates back to the Incas. He said he met a friend at the festival celebrated in El Alto Bolivia. The friend invited him to drink some beer. He was dancing and drinking and then claims he couldn't remember anything else until he woke up inside a coffin. He described to local media stations that he dreamt he was in his bed and felt the need to urinate, but as he came to, he realized he couldn't move. He awoke and found himself inside a coffin with a partial glass lid. Alvarez said, When I pushed the coffin, I was able to break the glass that it had, and that way I was able to get out. 
When I pushed the coffin, I barely broke the glass, and through the glass, there began to enter. They wanted to use me as a Sulu. The term Sulu refers to any offering commonly made to give back to Mother Earth, or Pachamama, by Bolivians throughout the year, but especially in August. The word is Quechuan and refers to fetus. They are frequently used in inaugurations and acquisitions. The erection of a new building falls under this parameter. There is also reference to it in the 1612 book Vocabulario de la Lengua Aymara by Ludovico Bertonio, where it was referred to as a soluna churacita, or abortion of rams. In other words, this type of offering goes back way back. The place where Alvarez was buried was in Achiacala, 50 miles from El Alto. Alex Magne, the young man who found him wandering around Seda de El Alto after he got out, said he was covered with dried mud and cement. His hand was also cut and bleeding. Victor Hugo Micah Alvarez claimed he was a human sacrifice that some fear are still offered, as they were in ancient times to satisfy Pachamama. He told police the story of what happened to him, but they refused to believe his story, telling him he was too drunk to know how he ended up buried in a coffin and to come back when he was healthy. His mother, Lydia, was interviewed, where she claimed her son was being sacrificed by being buried under a structure that was under construction. She said her son was traumatized and had problems sleeping. She believed his drink was drug. However, they could not pursue it further because they lacked the money to bribe police and prosecutors into action. When asked why he thought he was being sacrificed, Victor Hugo Micah Alvarez said he was buried next to a building under construction and that according to certain Aymara tradition, Pachamama demands an offering of a human life so the building will be strong and prosperous. This coupled with the timing in August, which is a very important month for the indigenous people where offerings are made to Madre Tierra. An Almata leader, Juan Carlos Bayón, said the best days to give offerings to Pachamama are Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, or Sunday, but especially Thursday since among their people is known as a day of the rays. Worship of Pachamama predates the arrival of Europeans and was adopted by the Incas in their traditions from the Chavan. The culture developed in the northern Andean highlands of Peru in adjacent areas of Bolivia from 900 to 200 BC. It's reported that llamas, especially white ones, are sacrificed to appease a demonic entity known as El Tío that guards the miners in Bolivia. A Bolivian miner said, The most important part of the llama is the blood. Blood is life and the gods don't bleed. If we don't give them blood, they will take miners' blood instead. The blood that is collected from the sacrificed llama whose throat is slit, is fed to the earth, painted on cheeks, and thrown against the mouth of the mine. The butchered remains are distributed as meat for human consumption. The bones are burnt into ash and given to El Tío, and the guts are buried. The belief in witchcraft, like the use of Sulus, is so common that in La Paz there is the Calle de las Brujas, or the witch's market that sells them. In El Alto, Mostly made up by Aymara and Quechua, Bolivia's two largest indigenous groups, Ritualist Cabin sells Sulus along with other offerings that are burned beneath the three peaks of Ilimani, La Paz's sacred mountain. I don't know if they're Ilimani or Iyimani. There have been long been rumors of human sacrifice, which coincides with Alvarez's story of being plied with alcohol in order to bury him as a life sacrifice. In the 2008 Bolivian film El Cementerio de los Elefantes, or The Elephant Cemetery, the movie portrays a man who spends the last weeks of his life drinking in a bar where alcoholics are allowed to drink themselves to death. In his drunken recall of his life, he remembers when he sold a drunk friend to builders to be buried as a Sulu. And again, I'm pronouncing S-U-L-L-U as Sulu, but it might be Suyu, that we do in the Spanish pronunciation. Alvarez's claim is not the first or narrow escape is made. However, there are others who disappear never to be heard of again. The homeless in Bolivia worry about where they go to sleep since they fear being carted off to be buried as a sacrifice. These incidents are rarely reported to the police. Since August is known when Sulu is offered to Pachamama through sacrifice in Bolivian building, it's thought wise to take care when drinking with strangers. In October 2022, Noemi Lazaro disappeared after she, after she told her family a friend had offered her a job as a cook in a new mine located in the town of Sorota in Bolivia. Then the family was told 
that when she heard how little she would be paid, she threw herself in the river. Noemi's family went to the mine and with firefighters searched the local river, which is not deep, but nothing was found. Her mother doesn't believe her daughter committed suicide. Iris, the person who took Noemi to the mine, made contradictory statements to the police, as did her husband and two other workers of the mine. They were arrested for police, by police for human trafficking, but the whereabouts of Noemi have not been explained. Her mother thinks that her daughter was enticed with a job and then offered it as a Sulu at the mine. In 2019, Telemundo did a short piece about the supposed abduction of drunkards in La Paz who were being immured in the foundation of buildings and bridges. The belief is their souls would act as guardians of the buildings and keep it strong. There are claims that construction companies pay off bars to give them people who are insensible from drink. A paranormal group came to investigate a certain area who said the victims would be buried face down so they would bear the weight of the structure on their back. They said there were close, there were those who were buried alive in the area they investigated and they offered a small ceremony for the repose of their souls. By the way, I did look, it is a very short video, <clears throat> and it's here on, this, on, the, on the site here on the Stranger Fix, and it's in Spanish, it's like a three or four minutes, it's, you know, and this was five years ago, this was even prior to this young man having that experience. Where was they were saying that all these bridges and all these buildings were going up in La Paz and Bolivia, and that there was this rumor going around that people were being sacrificed, and of course, you know they show the police, but how are the police going to investigate this if somebody is in the foundation of a bridge or a building? How are they going to find it? So they show they interview, you know, somebody from the police, and he's like, "Well, we'll find out." And I'm thinking, how are you going to find out? <laughs> <laughs> like they said, <clears throat> like now in August, I mean, apparently this can happen at any time, but August being such a significant month for this, they tell like the homeless, like be careful who you drink as in somebody putting something that totally knocks you out with the, I guess, when they're planning to take you off somewhere. And again, if you're homeless, which is, this happens all over the world, if there's nobody to come around and say, "Hey, what happened to so and so?" I haven't seen. That's it. Off you go. And this, and it, you know, according to this, maybe uh, you're holding a, a building or a bridge on your shoulders. Interesting, huh? Everybody thinks that you know what? I'm telling you, to all these festivals and stuff, there's always a darker side to some of these things. You know, one thing is all oh, Mother Earth and all this. I thought, that's fine. That's you know, whatever even though I'm not so thrilled with the uh, llama fetuses, but whatever, okay. But I'm telling you, in all of these religions, there's always like the ultimate sacrifice that beats everything out and out is the human. It'll beat anything you can offer, cow, chicken, goat, llamas, whatever. The ultimate sacrifice is always a human. Keep that in mind. Okay, then let's go off to fizz.org. All right, and this is a piece titled New DNA Analysis Helps Bust 200-Year-Old Royal Conspiracy Theory. New genetic analysis by an international team of scientists has helped bust a popular 200-year-old myth surrounding Kaspar Hauser, whose identity became one of the most mysterious riddles in German history. The study is published in iScience. Kaspar ha excuse me, Hauser was a youth who seemingly appeared out of nowhere in Germany in 1828, claiming he had grown up in captive isolation in a dungeon, looked after by a mystery man he never saw. Unable to speak or write, he carried an anonymous letter stating he had been kept in total isolation since he was a baby. The story captured the pu public's curiosity, making Hauser a celebrity. This attention increased when the king of Bavaria, Ludwig I, ordered that he be guarded day and night for his protection. This fueled speculation that his true identity could be that of a descendant of the House of Baden. The prince theory was that Hauser could be the son of the Grand Duke Karl, that he was kidnapped and swapped as a newborn, being replaced by a fatally ill baby that died when only a few weeks old. This would have framed Hauser as the rightful heir to the throne and altered the lineage of the House of Baden. 
Historians have debated over the mystery of Hauser's identity ever since, and as DNA fingerprinting technology emerged in the late 20th century, scientists have joined the efforts to solve the riddle. However, multiple DNA analysis of hair and blood samples obtained from his clothing performed over the last 30 years have provided conflicting results. Due to doubts about the authenticity of the clothing, or that it may have been contaminated by mucial, mucial procedures, it was decided to do a new independent study in the 2000s. Limitations in sampling and technology at the time means the results were ambiguous. This study carried out new sampling using much newer techniques. Now a team of scientists, including Professor Turi King, who is director of the Milner Center for Evolution at the University of Bath, and renowned for her work leading the identification of King Richard III, having used advances in forensic methods that allow much smaller fragments of ancient DNA to be anal analyzed. The improved sensitivity of the technique meant they could analyze the DNA from hair strands individually instead of pooling samples, checking the sequences matched, and proving the accuracy of the results. They also compared their results with previous research using blood samples taken from Hauser's clothing displayed at the Kaspar Hauser Museum. The team analyzed traces of mitochondrial DNA which is passed down the mother's line and were able to prove unambiguously that Hauser's mitochondrial DNA type did not match that of members of the House of Baden. Professor Turi King is an expert in the analysis of ancient DNA and genealogy. Previously based at the University of Leicester, Professor King led the research team that identified the remains of King Richard III after they were discovered in a car park in the city. She co-presents the BBC Two Series DNA Family Secrets, which uses DNA technology to solve family mysteries around ancestry and missing relatives. She said, after death, our DNA degrades into shorter and shorter fragments until there's nothing left to sequence. The DNA analysis methods available in the 1990s and early 2000s worked well with long DNA fragments, but didn't give consistent results when they did DNA analysis of the various items from Hauser. It's really exciting that we have been able to use the latest methods to finally answer the question and rule out the Prince theory. So I've worked on two cases involving potentially identifying members of a royal family, Richard III and Caspar Hauser. One where we prove the identification of a king, and one where we prove someone wasn't a prince. In both cases, there were mysteries that have carried on down through the centuries, and I love that science can be brought to bear to answer them. However, the true identity of Kaspar Hauser remains a mystery. Professor King said, Sadly, our data still can't tell us who he was. His mitochondrial DNA type is one that Westorians, is one that's, that is Westorians, but we can't narrow it down to a geographical region. So he still remains an enigma in terms of his origins. <coughs> that's very interesting. <coughs> but then you have to ask yourself, really what made it go and you ask yourself, why did he do it, was when he's being the, this Grand Duke, I mean, um, I'm sorry, not the Grand Duke, the Ludwig the first orders that he be guarded day and night. Why? That's weird, isn't it? Because really, that's really what leads everybody to jump on the bandwagon of he's a royal offspring or connected to some some royal house and this is why they've hit him as a baby if that would have happened he would have been just like some weird story and that would have been the end of that i wonder if eventually they're gonna get i, I guess unless they do a dna match to somebody let's see maybe ancestry will come through ancestry.com or one of those deals 23 and me will save the day just like it's captured some criminals maybe it'll give us a name of at least who he's descended from. Not, I'm not saying that it's royal, but just uh, who who is this mystery? And you know what? It, it's almost like the story that they have of Anastasia, supposedly the Romanov, you know, youngest daughter that people thought had survived. It turned out the lady that was claiming she was Anastasia was just a crazy lady who was Polish, not even Russian. And they proved it after DNA. And for many years, people were saying she was a Romanov. She was the the one child that had escaped the massacre of the Romanov family by the Bolsheviks. Turns out she wasn't. She was just a little bit cuckoo and 
convincing, I guess. All right, back to Stranger Than Fiction Stories. <clears throat> this is titled Bolivia's Death Road. The gravel path starts in the Bolivian rainforest and snakes along 43 miles of the most harrowing, dangerous stretch that for good reason is known as El Camino de la Muerte and claims about 300 lives every year. The official name is Carretera de los Yungas, or North Yungas Road, located in La Paz, Bolivia. Every factor that could contribute towards a kamikaze ride is present. Landslides, hairpin turns, year-long blinding fog, and steep cliffs with drop-offs of 2,000 feet. In the extreme, in the summer, extreme dust clouds churned by other vehicles inhibit visibility of where you're going and what's coming towards you. There are places where waterfalls land on its surface. Paraguayan prisoners of war were used in the 1930s to cut the route into the unyielding mountain to connect La Paz to the town of Coroico with plans to use it to transport goods. Even then, only small vehicles could be used as right turns don't allow for larger trucks. The road is no wider than 10 feet, which is why many trucks loaded with people and livestock went down off the side. There is no asphalt for tires to grip, only gravel and dirt with no guardrails to halt the progress of, vehicle, of a vehicle that has lost control, especially when rain makes it muddy and slippery. In 1946, 26 persons were killed when a truck plunged down a 500-foot cliff into the Tapampaya River. In 1960, a truck traveling to La Paz for Palm Sunday services slid off the mountain road into a ditch. 37 were killed, 15 were injured. This proved that even drivers who lived in the area and were supposedly experienced was no guarantee against the disaster. For those who are not natives, there's also the danger of the thin air. In 1961, Reverend Murray Dixon, who had been ministering in Bolivia since 1943, was found dead in his car. He was 46 years old and was presumed to have died from the effects of high altitude. He was en route from La Paz, where he lived, to the Yungas Valley. In 1999, eight Israeli tourists died on the road, which is when it was named the Death Road. While the rest of Bolivia drives on the right side, on this thin strip, vehicles drive on the left. This allows a driver a better view of the edge of the road. Vehicles heading down must yield and move to the outer edge. Many times passing can only be negotiated with both vehicles stopping first. Crosses in a macabre decoration line the road as memorials to those who never reach their destination. Once you leave La Paz, the road climbs a mountain pass known as La Cumbre to 15,260 feet above sea level as you traverse 43 miles before you come to a steep descent to nearly 4,000 feet. Despite its notorious reputation, it has become a tourist attraction, especially for thrill-seekers and adrenaline junkies. In 2009, a new route was opened to connect La Paz to Coroico with two lanes and guardrails. However, Yungas Road is still used mostly by backpackers, local workers, and bike tours, which accounts for most of the recent deaths. More than a dozen cyclists have died in the last 10 years. Often they do not have enough time to break before they are hurled into a fall of thousands of feet. The road has many names which are Death Road, Groves Road, Coroico Road, Camino de las Yungas, El Camino de la Muerte, Road of Death, Undubai, Yolosa Highway, and Ruta de la Muerte. It is not surprising that a roadway known for its many deaths is replete with ghost stories. Those that live in the area and traverse it often describe hearing voices laughing and crying. It is told that a trucker who regularly traveled on the Yungas Road came across an old man walking along the road. The man made a signal asking for a ride. The driver stopped since it was a cold foggy day and he felt sorry for the hitchhiker. Once inside the man started telling him his story, where he worked, who he was, and how much he loved his wife and children. An hour later, the man asked him to stop because he said they had come to his home. The old man then took off his coat and gave it to the driver, who had left his home without one. All he asked was that he should be returned when the driver came back on his way home. The driver delivered his cargo and, as promised on the return trip, stopped at the traveler's home. He followed a winding trail that ended in a small house that appeared to be uninhabited. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. After waiting a bit, he turned to leave when he saw two crosses. At that moment, a young man came around the side of the house and asked him, Who are you looking for? Since he didn't know the old man's name, he described a hitchhiker. The young man started to cry. The trucker asked him, 
Why are you crying? The other replied, The man you described is my father. He died two years ago along with my mother. They were returning from a trip where they had gone to sell coca leaves. The truck they traveled on rolled off the road and everyone inside was killed. The trucker could not believe the man who had written with him was a ghost. Another phantom that is regularly seen is a red dog that passes in front of vehicles many times causing an accident. In the Sur Yungas, there is a haunted castle known as El Chaco, or El Castillo del Loro, built for one-time president of Bolivia, José Luis de Jada Sorzano, who was descended from the Counts of Arastaya, a noble Spanish family. The edifice was constructed during the Chaco Wars, which was 1932 to 1935. Like the Death Road, it was built by Paraguayan prisoners of war. For many years, it stood desolate and unoccupied except for a caretaker. There are reports of footfalls on the highways and doors that open by themselves. One of the ghosts is supposed to be Tejada Sorsano himself. He was removed from power by a coup d'etat in 1936. Exiled in Chile, he died two years later. Since he was married to Elvira Flores y Artieda, he kept his mistress at the castle and deserted her when he left for Chile. She killed herself when she learned of his death and she is said to haunt the old structure. The property was later bought from the Sarsano heirs and converted into a hotel with an ecological preserve surrounding it. El Castillo del Loro is close to the small town of Chulumani, which is known for its healing mineral springs. The town square is a trade center for the farming communities in the area. Another ghost is said to be Klaus Barbie, the Nazi war criminal who lived in the sawmill above the town after he fled Germany in the aftermath of World War II. This property also belonged to the Tejada Sorsano family. During the 1950s, a certain Klaus Altman worked there as a supervisor. His true identity was Barbie, known as the Butcher of Lyon. He was discovered in 1972. Another source of the haunting is said to be the souls of the Paraguayans who built the castle and the death road and were buried in the surrounding jungles when they died. A caretaker who lived there during the years it was unoccupied reported that while in the kitchen he would hear whistling coming from the dining room. Scared to go investigate, he stayed in the kitchen. He said the ghost would whistle louder and louder, as if upset that it was being ignored. Another time while he slept, something came to lie on top of him, and then he heard steps and a door open and close as the entity left his bedroom. During the time it became a hotel, a group of friends and families came for a visit. The first night nothing happened, but the second night everything changed. One of the young ladies claimed she felt someone watching her when she was taking a shower. Later that night, while the group was standing in the foyer, the light started to blink and then went out. One of the girls screamed and said someone had touched her shoulder. She pulled back her shirt and found scratches ran across her skin. Later, they studied photographs taken during their stay and found the transparent form of a woman in the background of several pictures. Some wondered if this was Sorsano's deserted mistress. So there you go. And uh, let me tell you something. When you look at pictures of this death road, it's like you must have a death wish. I can, uh, you know what? I can see where people travel it, the ones that live there that have to. like. But people that go adrenaline junkies, it's like, you're crazy. You're, you're just crazy. That's it. So, uh, you're, not, you don't, you're not an adrenaline junkie. You have a death wish. And at, at least that's what I believe. That's, let me tell you something. That's got to be one harrowing trip. Anyway, guys, I hope you liked this little bit of eerie news, but I will be back soon with some more. Till then.